There is no director. Um, I'm the vice president of Students for Liberty uh, here on campus, and uh, we're delighted, one could even say elated, to have you here with us today. Uh, it's going to be a great speech, and uh, well worth your time, I'm quite convinced. Uh, so before we get going, there are just a few formalities to get out of the way. So uh, first off, I would like to extend a sincere thank you to Professor Alan Dalton for all of the uh, work he did in uh, uh, ensuring that this could get off the ground and going. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Professors Charlotte Twite, Scott Yenner, and um, Jeffrey Black for the uh, invaluable advice, tips, you know, what have you, that, uh, that they offered us. Um, I might as well say that, uh, in case it isn't already obvious, uh, Boise State University has some fantastic faculty. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a time when I, uh, a, a professor hasn't taken time out of their day to help me out, uh, ensure I know the material, um, or even just sit, sit down and talk. So uh, I think we're very blessed in that regard. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, so David Friedman received his BA in Physics and Chemistry from Harvard University. Uh, and his PhD in physics from the University of Chicago. Uh, interestingly enough, he then, uh, he's since gone on to teach law and economics, because why not? Um, he's uh, taught at uh, a number of universities, including uh, UCLA, the University of Pennsylvania, Columbia University, the University of Chicago, uh, and now teaches law at Santa Clara University in uh, California. Uh, he's the author of a number of books, including Price Theory and Intermediate Text, Law's Order, What Economics Has to Do with Law and Why It Matters, Hidden Order, The Economics of Everyday Life, The Machinery of Freedom, and most recently, uh, Future Imperfect, Technology and Freedom in an Uncertain World, among other numerous journal articles and publications and so on and so forth. Obviously, he's been quite prolific. Um, his 1973 work, The Machinery of Freedom, uh, was and remains a seminal work in the field of anarchism, or in other words, how a society could organize, organize itself uh, purely on the basis of voluntary cooperation. Uh, in that book, he lays out his ideas of what a free society might look like and how it might function. Um, Economics Nobel laureate James Buchanan recommended the book because, and I quote, it is high time to shift out of the pragmatic mindset that has been our national characteristic the grand alternatives for social organization must be reconsidered. And uh, in that book, he certainly reconsiders them. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm sure you're all tired of me prattling on like this, but uh, just one other thing. Uh, uh, at the end of the speech, there'll be about 15 or 20 minutes for uh, Q&A, so start uh, formulating those questions. Um, so without uh, further ado, it is my distinct honor to welcome uh, David Friedman. I don't actually have to be anywhere until tomorrow morning at 9.30 when I fly out. So I figure at the end of the talk there will be a Q&A until either you run out of questions or they kick us out of the room. Uh, I like to record my talks except when I forget to, which I too often do, which is what I was just turning on the recorder for. Uh, I wrote my first book, Machinery of Freedom, about 40 years ago. Uh, it's still in print in a second edition. Uh, it and quite a lot of other things can also be found on my web page for free. Uh, the web is a so-so technology for selling information, but a wonderful technology for giving it away. So if people are curious, you can find the bulk of my articles and all of my books that I could persuade the publishers to give me permission to web uh, are readable for free from my web page. That includes Law's Order, it includes Future Imperfect, it includes Machinery of Freedom, it includes uh, one, one novel, and a variety of other things. Uh, Machinery of Freedom is still in print, second edition. I've been thinking about doing a third edition, and in thinking about that, and in thinking about various other things, have in various ways tried to expand and deepen and improve the ideas in that book. And so what I wanted to do in this talk was first to sketch out uh, the system of institutions that I suggested in that book for how you could have a society in which the most fundamental functions of government were handled privately, 
in which you carried the sort of free market position all the way to its outer limit of replacing everything, uh, and then go on to discuss what I think I've learned since then. Uh, and I should say this owes a fair amount to the review by Jim Buchanan that was just quoted from, because the, that review was the only good review the book got. And my definition of a good review is a review that makes the author think. And Jim pointed out a hole in the line of argument I was proposing there, and I've spent some time trying to figure out how you fill that hole and what are the implications of doing so. So that's part of what I'll be talking about. Uh, but let me start by sketching uh, the basic model that I imagined when I, when I wrote that book in which I was saying if the free market works better for producing food and producing automobiles and producing books, maybe it could also work better for producing laws and law enforcement. And how could you imagine institutions in which that happened? And the basic model I imagined is a society where there are private firms that sell the service of protecting your rights and settling disputes you have with people. And essentially, everybody chooses to be a customer of one such firm. And then there is a problem which occurs to everybody who you discuss this to, and they explain why your system can't possibly work. And the problem is that I come home uh, to find that my television set is missing. And I check the automatic camera that my rights enforcement agency installed in my living room in case somebody stole something, and they find a photograph of Professor Dalton walking out the front door with my television. And so my rights enforcement agency gets in touch with him and they say, please return Professor Friedman's television set and you owe us 50 bucks for our time and trouble locating you and getting it back. And his reply is, what television set? I've got a nice television set, it's true. A friend of mine sold it to me a year or so ago, never heard anything about Professor Friedman. Didn't he teach at DPI a long time? Anyway, another story. Uh, so my rights enforcement agency says, well, if you're not willing to discuss the matter and to somehow uh, provide evidence of having bought the television set, uh, tomorrow morning three big tough guys are going to show up at your door to go through the door in any way necessary and take our customer's television set back to him. And Professor Dalton says, well, that's very interesting, but you have to realize I too have a rights protection agency. And my rights enforcement agency, when I call them up and say that three thugs are going to come and try to steal my television set, they'll send five big tough guys to protect me. And now people say, aha, system breaks down, turns into chaos, warfare, violence, and so forth. And this is the answer that Ayn Rand gave at some point and that many, many other people have given. But it's the wrong answer. And it's the wrong answer because these agencies are profit-making firms and violence is expensive. And it ought to be clear to them that there is a better solution. So in the story as I've described it, my agency gets in touch with his agency and they say, look, we got a problem. If we end up with our employees fighting your employees, somebody might get hurt, uh, your customer's house might get trashed in the process, this is not the way to satisfy our customers. How about we go to a private arbitrator a private firm in the business of settling disputes that both of us know is honest and competent. And we agree that if the arbitrator says that it's Professor Friedman's television set, that you agree you will not defend Professor Dalton when we come to take the television set away. And if it says that it's Professor Dalton's television set, we will pay you some modest, modest indemnity for the trouble we have put to you by falsely accusing your customer of, of robbery. Uh, they agree, problem settled. Now, of course, it's not really going to be improvised this way because these two agencies know that over a period of years this story is going to happen over and over again because there are going to be legal disputes between customers of one agency and the other. And so the obvious long-term solution is that the two agencies agree in advance that all such disputes will go to the private court that both of them trust and that both of them will abide by the verdict. And now the immediate question that ought to occur to you is, well, it's all very nice that they made this agreement, but what enforces that agreement? Because this is a world in which there is no government. There is no court system above the agency. And the answer is that what enforces that agreement is what we sometimes refer to as the discipline of constant dealings. 
the fact that these are repeat players. And each agency knows that if when the decision goes against their customer, they refuse to abide by it, then next time when it goes the other way, the other uh, agency won't abide by it. They're back stuck fighting each other. That's going to result in their doing a bad job of protecting their customers, having to pay hazard pay to their employees, and pretty soon both of them will lose all their customers to other agencies that have a more reasonable and responsible and sensible policy and settle all of their disputes peacefully via arbitration rather than violently uh, by violence. So that's the the guts of the institutions that I'm imagining. Uh, and the next question is where does the law come from? All right, what are these legal rules that are being enforced? And the answer is that it's being produced on the, on the market. And it's being produced by the private courts. Because each private court has some set of rules which determine how it settles cases. And when a rights enforcement agency contracts with a court, it is in effect buying for its customers that set of legal rules. Because now disputes its customers get into will be settled under those rules. Uh, this is a polylegal system in the sense that the legal rules between me and you may not be the same as the legal rules between the two of them or even the legal rules between me and somebody else because each pair of agencies is contracting on a court. There is going to be some market pressure towards uniformity just because it's convenient to people if the rules are similar across the different agencies. But there doesn't have to be uniformity. Uh, and so there may be some agencies which specialize in customers who want detailed water law because their customers live in arid areas where it's really important to know who has the right to draw water from a river. And there may be others that specialize in customers who don't want that because it's just a nuisance because they live in areas where water is free. Uh, and there'll be lots of other, of other variations. So then the question is, what kind of law are you going to get? What can you say about the legal rules produced by this system? And the argument I offered in the book, which I'm going to qualify a little bit later on, is that this system will tend to produce what economists refer to as efficient legal rules. Where by efficient legal rules, we mean rules that maximize the summed benefit to the parties they affect. And let me walk you through how this happens. We will imagine that my agency and your agency are discussing whether or not to go to a court that believes in capital punishment. And my agency finds that its customers like capital punishments. Its customers are quite confident they will never be convicted of killing anybody, and they want to make sure that anybody who kills them uh, ends up going to the electric chair, because that way they think people will be deterred from killing them. Your agency, on the other hand, finds that its customers have the opposite opinion, that they're a little bit worried that they might be convicted correctly or incorrectly of killing somebody, and they don't really believe the death penalty deters anyway, and they think it's sort of morally objectionable to kill people. So the customers of one agency want the death penalty, the customers of the other agency doesn't. How do you settle this? Well, my agency does some market research. They explore the tastes of their customers, in order to answer the question, if we could guarantee them that disputes with that agency over there went to a pro-death penalty court, how much more would they be willing to pay for our services? And they conclude that getting a pro-death penalty court is worth a million dollars a year to their customers. Your agency does similar research with theirs, and they conclude that getting an anti-death penalty court is worth $2 million a year to their customers. So the two agencies agree on an anti-death penalty court, and your agency either makes a side payment to my agency of something between a million and two million, or concedes on some other disputed issue to do what my agency wants. And that seems to me a fairly simple, rough sketch of how in this system law will be generated. And the economists in the audience will hopefully see that this means that Roughly speaking, and again, I'm going to have to qualify this in a few minutes, but roughly speaking, that you tend to get those legal rules that maximize the benefits to those concerned. Because if my customers value the rule more than yours do, they get their rule, vice versa the other way. So that was the basic logic of the system as I described it uh, when I wrote Machinery, say, about, about 40 years ago. Uh, I now want to discuss 
uh, things that were missing from that argument, some of which alter it and some of which don't. And I think they fit into at least three categories for the moment, only three categories that are the market for law. There's a fourth category that I may get into, which has to do with what is or isn't the government anyway, uh, but we'll, we'll see about that. And the three categories, one of them is market failure on the market for law. All right. Market failure is an economist term, and like a lot of technical terms, it's misleading. All right. Uh, I like to give an equivalent all the people out there who think that they understand the theory of relativity, except for the mathematical details. Right, the theory of relativity says everything's relative, I understand that. But of course, that's not what the theory of relativity says. Similarly, market failure is not a description of all forms of failure, and it is not about markets. All right, market failure is a situation one way in which failure occurs, and it occurs in many contexts other than markets as well as markets. What's market failure? Market failure is a situation in which individual rationality doesn't lead to group rationality. So uh, my standard example, one of my several standard examples, occurred, was observed by me when I was teaching at UCLA. Because just south of UCLA, there is what the locals claim to be the busiest highway intersection in the world or at least claimed it when I was there a long time ago, like eight lanes or ten lanes each way. And every day you see the same pattern. The lights on Wilshire are about to, to change, and the drivers on Wilshire keep trying to cross, and the result is that when the light goes red, Wilshire is packed solidly with cars, and the people coming the other way, I think it's Westwood, I think, I'm not sure, whatever the other street are, can't get through. And gradually those cars drain out just in time for the people going the other way to fill up the intersection when their light turns red. Right. Think about that situation. No driver is making a mistake. All right. Each driver would be even worse off if he politely waited to go into the intersection until he was sure he could get across. But all of the drivers would be better off if all of them behaved that way. All right. So that's a nice, simple example of market failure. It's a case where because my action imposes costs on you, which I ignore, and your action imposes costs on me, which I ignore, each of us acting to maximize his own welfare produces a result which is worse for all of us than if we had acted differently. All right, that's one example. I've got lots of other examples, but that one will, will do for the moment. All right, I want to talk about market failure on the market for law. All right, imagine we've got my system. What will go wrong? Where won't it generate efficient law? And the answer is that it won't generate efficient law in any case where the legal rule between me and you affects him. All right, and the simplest example for this is intellectual property. Suppose the question is, should the court our agencies agree to hold that he can't copy my books without my permission? Could it enforce copyright law? I'm not going to discuss here the very difficult question of whether copyright law is a good idea or whether patent law is a good idea. It's an interesting question. I don't really know the answer for sure. But my point now is suppose it's true that copyright law is a good idea. Let's look at the costs and benefits and who, who pays and who receives. If the agencies agree to go to a court that recognizes copyright law, then when Professor Dalton wants copies of my books, he's going to have to pay me royalties to, to get them. That's just a transfer. He loses the money, I gain some money. That's no net gain to either. Second, uh, there, is going to be, there are going to be a couple of costs. One of them is the cost of enforcing that rule, making sure he isn't pirating the book. Uh, and another is the fact that some people will choose not to read a book or not to buy a book or not to copy a book because the royalty is higher than the value to them. Why is that a net cost? Because it costs me nothing at all for you to copy my book. So as long as there is any value to you to having a copy, the net effect on both of us is higher if you copy it. But as long as I charge a price because I want some money for my books above zero, there will be some people for whom the book is worth more than zero but less than the royalty who don't get a copy. That's a deadweight loss. That's what economists refer to as the deadweight loss of intellectual property, property rights. So that's a cost. Uh, what's the 
benefit that might balance it. The benefit that might balance that is I have an incentive to write books. All right, you can't copy a book if it isn't written. And copyright law means that I get some money by writing books. Uh, therefore, it might be the case, for all I know it is the case, that we're better off in a world with copyright law, which gives people an incentive to write books, even though there are the costs that I've described to it. But now, think about the bargain between my agency and his agency. Only a small fraction of the people who will read my books are customers of either agency. So if he agrees to pay me royalties, that results in my producing more books, and most of the benefit of my producing more books goes to the people who are not in the bargain, goes to the customers of other agencies. All right. So that means that our agencies may choose not to create copyright law, even though it's worth creating. Right? Even if the net benefit is larger than the net cost, since all of the costs go to their customers, and only some of the benefits go to their customers, it might turn out that they don't have copyright law when they should. So that's a case where you get an inefficient outcome uh, coming out of copyright, co coming out of the market for law due to the standard source of inefficiencies on other markets, what economists call externalities, the fact that our decision affects other people who aren't part of the market. Right? So that's one thing I realized after I wrote the book that was a respect in which I'd overstated my case, that my market has a tendency to produce efficient laws, just as the market for producing steel has a tendency to produce steel only when it's worth more to the people who use it than it costs to produce. But the market for producing steel also produces air pollution, which doesn't get counted in the calculation. And some of my legal rules also produce costs or benefits for third parties, which get left out of the calculation. And I should say it may have occurred to some of you that while the example I gave was intellectual property law, I could have given the example of pollution law. Because if our agencies agree that you can sue me when my smokestack puts out stuff that makes you cough, your being able to sue me means I put out less of that stuff. That stuff will also influence people who aren't customers of our two agencies, and therefore the incentive to have strong legal rules against pollution will be inefficiently weak. All right, so uh, I'm not a utopian. I am not claiming and have never claimed that the institutions I'm arguing for are perfect, merely that they're better than any alternative that I know. Because if you think not about my system for making law, but about the way we presently make law, it's hard to see that there's any substantial incentive to make efficient legal rules. That if you think about how a democratic government works, or any other government, but think about democratic ones, because those are the ones we're most familiar with, uh, what incentive does the government have to do the right things? And there's what I think of as the civics class model of democracy. And the civics class model of democracy say your representatives have to do good things because otherwise you'll vote them out. And the trouble with that model is that in order to vote them out, you have to know they're not doing good things. Think about your incentives as a voter. If you spend a lot of time and effort following what your congressman is doing, which means both finding out how he voted in each, in each vote in Congress, and more difficult, figuring out for each of the things he voted about whether it was good or bad. Even then, you don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy. Because it might be that if you went to him and you said, look, you voted for that bill, that's a bad bill, he would say, you're right, it's a bad bill. But I had to vote for that to get some other congressman to vote for this good bill of mine, which is much more important. He might be telling the truth. You don't know. My point is that actually monitoring your representatives in the way you would have to do in order for the civics class model of democracy to work would take a lot of effort by you. It would be costly. What benefit do you get for that effort? Essentially zero. Because you know that in a large population polity, and even Idaho is a large population polity, let alone the United States, the chance that your vote will, it will change the outcome is very, very close to zero. I figure for a presidential election, it's probably about one in five million. People talk about how close the Florida vote was uh, in a recent presidential election. Yes, indeed. If you had cast 10,000 votes, you could have changed the outcome. But you don't cast 10,000 votes. So as far as I know, and I may be wrong, there is never, I do not know of any election at the national 
level in which I include Congress and Senate, congressmen as well as presidents that has ever been decided in the U.S. by one vote or by ten votes or by fifty votes even. Uh, there have been close elections but not that close. So you as a rational person will say, if I spend this time and effort figuring out uh, what my congressman is doing and whether I approve of him, I will get no benefit for doing so. There are many other ways I could spend my time and money, some of which do provide a benefit. For example, I could spend my effort deciding what car to buy. When I do that, if I decide that one car is better than another, sure enough, that's the one I get. So in the ordinary market context, your decision determines what happens to you, and you therefore, as a rational individual, have an incentive to be well informed. In the political marketplace, you, your decision has essentially no effect on what happens to you, and therefore you, as a rational individual, have an incentive not to be well informed. It's not worth the cost. This is what economists who teach what's called public choice theory refer to as rational ignorance. It is rational to be ignorant when information costs more than it's worth. Given rational ignorance, the whole civics class model breaks down. All politicians say they are good guys. What you actually know is whether he is handsome or whether he has a nice voice or whether he uh, does a good job of, uh, you know, I don't know what the appropriate term is, but, but throwing the ball more or less. Of, 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 of giving speeches that sound pleasant, uh, but you don't actually know whether he's doing the right things or the wrong things. I could go into more detail if this were a talk on public choice theory, but my basic point is that when I concede that uh, my market for law will do an imperfect job of producing efficient law, I don't regard that as a reason to reject it because uh, the alternative, which is law produced through political mechanisms, it seems to me will do a very much more imperfect job. Has uh, the surprise of anything is that we've survived at all, uh, that it has not done a bad enough job to result in all of us starving to death. But it nonetheless does a bad job in lots of ways. I could go into details. As you probably know, the U.S. has the highest incarceration rate of any developed country in the world. The reason it does so is that it is politically popular for bad reasons to have laws against the use of certain recreational drugs. Uh, as far as I can tell, there are no good arguments for that position, at least that I've managed to discover in the last 40 years, and it imposes immense human costs, direct or indirect. You could think of a lot of other examples. That's, that's just, just one that happens to, happens to strike me. Uh, so, so to put it differently, I would have said that not just in my case, but in general, that in terms of ordinary private markets, market failure is the exception, and in terms of political markets, market failure is the rule. Because in most political, what causes market failure? The fact that I am making a decision where I don't bear the costs and benefits. Almost all political decisions have that characteristic, that when you vote, if you vote for the right guy, most of the benefits goes to other people. If you vote for the wrong guy, most of the costs do. When you lobby for something that will benefit your industry, the costs go to other people, to your customers probably, uh, and so forth. So the fact that market failure exists on private markets, is, it's a real fact about them. It means they will not run as well as if a perfectly wise, benevolent philosopher king were running the world, but we have a striking shortage of perfectly wise, benevolent philosopher kings. Uh, and it seems to me that in general, markets do better than the alternative, in any case. But as I say, it doesn't do perfectly, and it doesn't do perfectly in predictable ways. I'm predicting that if they ever set up my system, you will have a less than optimal level of intellectual property protection and a less than optimal level of anti-pollution law. Whether better or worse than the state, I can't tell you. The state might have less than optimal, more than optimal, don't know. Okay. All right, second point has to do, second point is really aimed more at the economists in the audience than anybody else. And that has to do with thinking about what this market for law really is. And I like to think of it as the market for legal assent, because what's happening is that you are getting people to agree on the legal rules between them. And as the institutions would actually exist, the individuals aren't doing that. As the rules would exist, the rights enforcement agencies are picking courts which make the rules, but the individuals are picking rights enforcement agencies. So in effect, the individuals are indirectly through middlemen uh, choosing, choosing what rules apply to them. Uh, and let me do one way that economics textbooks sometimes start out is with Robinson Crusoe. They say, imagine that instead of having the elaborate system of 
middlemen and corporations and unions and everything else. Imagine just a, a few people doing things. Uh, my price theory textbook, for example, and my book Hidden Order, which is the price theory textbook rewritten to be read for fun instead of because people make you read it. Uh, I should say, as, as an interest,